Welcome to Education. Today we do have another music-focused video on some tech terms that are super helpful for music educators to know. Now, my goal here is to keep them pretty quick and simple, so I'm gonna try not to like nerd out about all of them. First thing we're gonna look at are terms that are related to computers. The first thing on our list here are three different file types. For those of you who don't know, when you save something on a computer, you're saving it as a specific file type. This could be a doc, this could be a docx, this could be a text document, uh, this could be a JPEG, these are all different file types. Audio is pretty straightforward. These are our MP3s, our waves, things like that. They're simply a package of ones and zeros that your computer can then use to generate sound. To oversimplify it, a MIDI file is basically just a list of keystrokes and when those keystrokes happen. If you're using something like Sibelius or Finale and you export a MIDI file, you can take that and put it into something like GarageBand and choose different instruments to play whatever lines you want. The term MIDI sometimes is used to just describe like a practice track that only uses the piano from the computer. The important thing to note though is if you're sending a guide track, this is most likely an audio file. What you wanna be sure of though is if somebody says, hey, can you send a MIDI file of this piano recording? You wanna make sure that you're actually exporting a MIDI file and not just taking that MIDI track you've recorded and turning it into an audio file. I've actually had that happen a few times. Now the last one, a music XML file, is super useful, especially if you're working with a bunch of different people who all use different notation softwares. Sibelius, Finale, NoteFlight, MuseScore, I don't know any more than that. A music XML file can almost be seen as like a jacked up MIDI file. Not only does it have the keystrokes of MIDI where you get when is the note playing? How long is it? How strong is the note that's playing? They also can contain lyrics, dynamic markings, crescendo markings, all of that stuff. It's meant as a way to send score information from one notation software to the other. I use Sibelius, but I know a lot of people who use Finale, so it lets me write out a score and then send it to them. You can also import music XML files into Logic, GarageBand, and it will work similar to a MIDI file where you get all of the MIDI tracks for virtual instruments. The only difference is if there is a score editor in that program, like Logic has one, it will actually import the lyrics too, which is really cool. To wrap up the computer section of this, we want to talk about digital audio workstations or DAWs. This refers to programs like GarageBand, Logic, Pro Tools, Cubase, FL Studio, everyone's open source free favorite, Audacity. The idea behind digital audio workstations is rather than having to lug around a giant console and a tape machine, it's all contained in the computer. They can record, they can mix, they can usually use virtual instruments except Audacity. Sorry, everyone. The important thing to note here is that most of them have the same functions and they're generally represented in a similar way. For instance, you're always gonna have a button with a circle on it for record, you're always gonna have the little triangle for play, the square for stop. This is great because you can go between software and not be afraid of them. Essentially, once you know how to use one of them, you're like 95% of the way to knowing how to use all of them. Now we're gonna jump into some audio or sound terms. The first one is a mixer versus an interface. A mixer in its most basic form takes in audio sources, lets you process them and mix them with the intention of sending them as audio out of the mixer to speakers or to some sort of recorder. An interface, on the other hand, takes in audio which passes through an analog to digital converter with the purpose of being able to send it to a computer. So that was a little techy, and it can be confusing because you look at this thing and it's like, well, this has microphone inputs on it and it has dials and it has a knob. So like, why is this an interface and not a mixer? To make it even more confusing, I'm running my audio through a digital mixer right now, which has analog to digital converters. To make it even more confusing, my digital mixer can work as an audio interface. So what's the practical difference? To oversimplify it, the job of the mixer is to take in audio process it, and then send the audio out. If you take away all the bells and whistles, the job of the interface is just to translate audio into data so that a computer can use it. The next one is huge, especially if you have to do sound for a theater program or concerts. The gain versus the volume. Think of it this way. Gain sets the level on the way in, volume sets the level on the way out. The purpose of the gain knob is to boost an incoming signal so that it works as efficiently as possible with the circuits inside the board. If your gain is too low and you have to turn the volume fader all the way up, you're gonna introduce a lot of unnecessary 
just electronic circuit noise to your signal. If you turn the gain up too high, no matter how loud your volume is, the signal's gonna be distorted. Once your gain is set properly, the volume faders let you balance that sound with all of the other sounds you have running through the board as one final step before it gets sent out to the speakers. If you're new to mixing boards and you have to run sound, I would suggest doing this. During the mic check, encourage the performer to do something that is the max volume that they're gonna put out. Turn up the gain knob until you see the little red clip light turn on. That means it's distorting. Then turn it down like 10 minutes. Speaking of microphones, dynamic versus condenser microphones. I could talk about mics all day, but we're gonna keep this super simple. Dynamic mics, think like a normal vocal microphone, are relatively low sensitivity and they're super rugged. More importantly, they don't require any power. Condenser microphones, so like your headset mics, lav mics, large diaphragm condensers, the little pencil mics, the small diaphragm condensers, those uh, boom mics that they make for like choirs now. These are just all around more sensitive, but they also require phantom power. Mixers usually have a way of indicating phantom powers on, but there's usually a button that says plus 48. If that is pushed down, it means that phantom power is activated. If you find a mic in a closet somewhere and you plug it in and it's not working, there's a chance it could be a condenser microphone, so don't rule it out as broken until you do some research on it and see if it needs phantom power. I actually had this happen once where there were boundary microphones that somebody actually wanted to throw away because they thought they were broken, they weren't getting any sound out of them, and I just plugged them in and turned on phantom power and they worked perfectly. I knew that they were condenser mics just from looking at them, and generally phantom power won't hurt dynamic mics. However, it's always safest to just do a quick Google search and see what type of mic you're working with. Now, second to last, we have something that most people probably find very boring, but I find super exciting, and that is proper names for different connections. The thing that I love about this is you can run just crazy amounts of adapters, and as long as they all have the same number of connections, it will work. The important disclaimer to make here is, even if they all fit and stuff, don't really go trying to like jerry-rig things until you have a strong understanding of different signal levels. As an example, just because you can make a headphone jack fit into a power amp doesn't mean that your headphones aren't gonna blow out. Again, this is for troubleshooting. Don't get too crazy with it until you understand how not to break stuff. The connections that I find myself talking about most of the time are coaxial, tip sleeve or TS, tip ring sleeve or TRS, tip ring ring sleeve, TRRS, and then your XLR cable. On top of this, there are different sizes. So your standard headphone jack is gonna be 1 8 inch or 3.5 millimeters. Quarter inch cables, on the other hand, are generally seen all over mixers. They're those like silver jacks. It's also what an instrument cable or a guitar cable is. Oftentimes on mixers, the headphone jack will actually be quarter inch and not eighth inch. The important thing to know about these is that they have signal connections, but then they always also have a ground connection. In the case of the TS or the tip sleeve cable, the tip of the cable is the hot signal and the sleeve of the cable is the ground. This is important because there's two connection points, but there's only one hot signal. Your standard headphone cable is a TRS cable and the tip is the left channel, the ring is the right channel, and then the sleeve is ground. An XLR cable, which people refer to as mic cables, has two connections and one ground as well. Why am I telling you this? Because if you're using adapters, you always wanna to try to match the number of connections. For instance, microphones use both hot connections in an XLR cable, so if you, for some reason, needed to convert it to quarter inch, make sure you use a TRS cable so that you get those three connections connection points. Again, two hot signals and the ground. Then later on, if you need to convert it back to XLR, you still have the same number of connections. As an example, my mixer has a quarter inch headphone jack on it. So I'm gonna assume that that is TRS. Because my headphones have an eighth inch connector, I'm gonna use this adapter to plug them in. That turns it from a quarter inch to an eighth inch. Perfect. However, when I listen to it, I'm only getting music out of the left side. Taking a closer look at this adapter, it has a T S connection. That means that there's only one hot signal and then the ground. And as I mentioned earlier on headphones, the tip connection is the left channel. What I should have used was this connector. This one is also quarter inch to eighth inch, but as you can see, it is a TRS. It has a tip, ring, and sleeve, which again, as I mentioned earlier, is left, right, and then the ground. Just remember that cables are just copper wire in a tube. It's the number of connections on the end 
that matters. The one exception is speaker cables. Those are specially made to have just huge amounts of signal blasted through them, so just don't go plugging random things into the business end of a powered speaker or a power amp. The last couple terms that I want to quickly discuss are soundproofing versus acoustic treatment. These terms get thrown around a lot, and I'll just scroll through Amazon reviews of people who literally just bought the wrong product for what they were trying to do and can't understand why it didn't work. The way we want to think of soundproofing is isolating a room from the things happening outside of it. This means a soundproof room will prevent sound from getting in from the outside and prevent sound inside the room from getting out. For instance, if you're in the choir room and the marching band is practicing in the band room and you can hear it through the walls, you could use some more soundproofing. If you're trying to record something and you live next to a gas station like I do, you probably could use more soundproofing. Acoustic treatment, on the other hand, this is your foam panels, your wooden diffusers, those are to affect the sound that is happening inside the room, to affect the reflections. Again, this can be absorption, where if I clap, it deadens the sound of the clap and actually absorbs that acoustic energy. Or diffusion, which creates non-parallel surfaces so that the sound is dispersed more evenly and in a pleasant way. Your auditorium at school probably uses a combination of diffusion and absorption. Your gym, however, probably does not. Along with the microphone video, I am going to do a basics of live sound for teachers video, so keep an eye out for that. All right, we made it. That was a lot of talking about how to talk. As usual, if you have any questions or if you think there's anything I missed, comment it down below. Get the conversation started in the community. Thank you for stopping by and I will see you next time.